All right, hello everyone and welcome back. For this segment of our presentation, I'm joined by my good friend and fellow Uplift admin, Amanda Freebaron. How's life, Amanda? I am doing great. How are you, Leo? Doing pretty good. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a just a quick summary of where we left off in our, our fourth presentation. Uh, and uh, this slide probably is familiar then if you've seen that uh, presentation, that segment, but we're gonna re replay this one and, and uh, maybe get Amanda's thoughts here. But again, this comes from our 2013 faith crisis report that was commissioned by the church, um, our leaders, and a, and a wonderful report. We again encourage everyone to, uh, when you get the PowerPoint uh, downloaded uh, from, from us, from Uplift, that you go in and make sure you access this faith crisis report and, and review it and go through it. It's got a lot of great information. And this is one of the key findings from the report. And just so just a reminder uh, that this segment we're going to be talking about a lot together today, Amanda and I, about how to better minister to those who are doubting. And this is a big question that a lot of us um, need to learn how to answer. Uh, and so a lot of the principles that we are going to share together today, hopefully will help you in that journey toward uh, healing with your friends and family members and loved ones who have either left the church or who are doubting and are questioning. So uh, we're just excited for this next segment. Um, any thoughts, Amanda, as we, as we begin? Uh, words of wisdom you want to share? Uh, no, I am I am excited to go through, uh, I go through this presentation because I, I really believe that um, keeping relationships strong and supportive as uh, you or a loved one is going through a faith crisis um, makes a really big difference because when you're struggling with a faith crisis, you just kind of feel like you need a safe place to land. So I think understanding how to keep these relationships strong is um, really important. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and, and move to the next slide here. Uh, and this is what this is one of our I call them the money slides. You know the one the ones that we just I end up sending out to people over and over again. Um, just really excited to show this one and to talk through it. So what I'll do since I'll I'll be the bad guy. Is that okay, Amanda? If I'm the bad guy, I'll be on the divisive side. <laughs> and then you can be the the healing, uh, wonderful uh, voice over here in the inclusive side. So I'll read on the left, and then you can follow me on the right. Here we go. Divisive messages are as follows. You are headed toward apostasy. Um, um, and a better inclusive message would be, I want to hear about your journey. So like the opposite, right? Would be This would be something we would say to divide, that would help, help, have someone feel like they're being pushed away or squeezed out of the church or even out of a family. Um, and then this one's the opposite of what we would try to try to do. Why, why is this one, uh, what, what's the importance here, do you think, the difference? Well, I think that um, it's very likely, um, even, even if you have experienced faith challenges, um, if you're talking to someone who is going through a faith crisis, it's very likely that you don't quite understand what their experience is like, or maybe even if you do understand the experience of a faith crisis, um, it gives you a better starting point, um, both from a relationship, like a point of trust, um, uh, and, and it also helps you to know, okay, where is this coming from? What ways can I support this person? Um, rather than just kind of giving this prescriptive this, I know all about what you're doing and you're heading toward apostasy. And especially, you know, I can, I can testify to this, you are heading toward apostasy. Um, I can testify to that, that that is not true. It, it is a, it's a false statement. There are many people who have struggled with faith either because they've encountered anti-Mormon material or they, um, 
uh, have gone through a big other kind of crisis in their life that's led them to question their faith or they disagree with social policies, whatever, who have made it through that journey and actually ended up with a stronger faith, not just in God um, or in the Savior, but also have a better, healthy strong, faithful relationship with, with the, uh, church. Um, so, so I, I don't think that that divisive message, it's not only harmful, it's also not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, there's fear, I think, underneath that message, right? Right. Uh, Feeling of fear that's there. So, okay. Uh, we've got a lot of these, so we probably can't talk in depth about everyone, but maybe we'll just go through and then at the end we can and I just realized that we've got a lot to do here. So we're, we're going to read through these and then uh, back and forth. And then at the end, we can pick out the, the key items. But I think that's a good framework that you set up, Amanda. Really wise words there. Thank you. So I'll read this side and then you just follow right after. Okay. The vice of message again is you are being influenced by Satan. And the more inclusive message would be, do you feel a connection to God? Doubt is sinful. Um, Doubt is normal. Let's work through it. You need to pray more. Can we pray together? You need to read your scriptures more. Can we read the scriptures together? Do you want to lose your family? How's your family feeling about this? Do you want to break your covenants? How do you feel about the temple? Stop reading anti-Mormon materials. What are you studying? Can I join you? I don't know, but I have a testimony of dot, dot, dot. I don't know, but let's learn together. I don't want you sharing that with me. Please share. I'll try to understand need to get the Holy Ghost back. Uh, Do you believe that God can guide us? You need more faith. Are you hoping for strengthened faith? You're hurting and scaring me. I care about you and I'm here for you. Okay. So that's the last one. Um, Anything else that kind of draws your attention here, Amanda? Um, I guess I would just point out in terms of some of these things, like you need to read your scriptures more. You need to be keeping your covenants. Um, you need to stop reading this or that. You need to pray more. A lot of those things are, are likely true, um, but they're true for all of us, right? We all need to be focused more on our covenants. We all need to focus more. We all can improve our prayer. We all can improve our scripture study. And so, and, and those things are, are very likely true. Um, but what the ideal, um, situation is we need to first help the person who's doubting feel safe and comfortable approaching prayer and scriptures and the temple. Um, and, uh, then, then you get them to that point, um, where, you know, they have an interest in, uh, renewed scripture study or prayer. Um, but first the, again, they need to feel like, um, you're, they're not being, you're not accusing them of some sort of wrongdoing that you are there to help them instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the defensiveness that's on the left uh, hand side is is just so it's just it's just all about defending and it's defending. I mean, all parties involved, right? Is you're really people that speak the, these way, you know, this way are a lot of them are come, have a, a, a great amount of love in their hearts and and really do want to bless people. Like a, imagine a, a parent talking to a, a son or a daughter who is leaving the church and and they're they're motivated by love a lot of the times, but there's also can be also fear um, and ignorance involved in these messages. And so this is a place of vulnerability where you are willing to step down in empathy, right? To step down into that pit with someone and just to really listen to them, without without a uh, without any fear of you know being pulled to the dark side. We have Star Wars coming out again uh, soon. <laughs> My wife's <laughs> excited for that movie, but you know. 
we don't need to be afraid of of this dark side or what you know whatever you want to call it um, of losing our testimonies if if we're prepared if we um, if we you know we studied and, and we're prepared with with light of Christ burning within us um, we can minister and in, in effective ways and really connect with the person deep deeply connect with them without having to be afraid of losing our own testimonies like I can we don't need to treat it like an infection right like a disease uh, doubt and we've talked about that frequently but yeah so just a few other thoughts there um, anything else on this slide just it's a great slide so I don't want to mm -hmm. go, go past it too fast but uh, we can um, I, I guess um, I would to comment on the inclusive messages the whole general idea is just helping um, the person who's struggling feel like you are there for them and uh, you want to work through this together um, uh, I would point out and I know this has been been mentioned before in previous videos but um, the a faith crisis is is not just a crisis of belief or understanding or religion. It's an identity crisis, and it can feel very, 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 very lonely. And so just getting past that first step of just feeling in complete lonely despair um, is very important in order to, you know, for that person to open up to whether it's apologetic type answers or um, open, open up to, you know, receiving personal revelation from God. Um, they've got to get out of that really, really dark spot first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, yeah, caring about the person, you know, overt, overtly caring, like just obvious, make it so obvious that you just care so much. Uh, and and that and if you do that um, and kind of follow the guide that we've given you here, if you're listening to this and you're a parent or a child with parents who have left or a close friend or family member, spouse or whatever it is, this kind of approach um, is really important. Just this kind of guiding principle. So as you speak with the person, uh, try to remember some of these examples. But you'll have to we have to pray and ask for guidance on how to, to speak in other ways and other situations that are different from these. So these are just a, a small sampling. It's not an exhaustive list, right? We have all kinds of scenarios that come in front of us, uh, difficult, difficult situations. And we just, we were just trying to um, encourage everybody to try to follow this kind of guiding principle here and how you speak to people. Cause there are so many people, um, this is part of the reason why I, I think didn't tell anybody about my faith crisis. I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way, but, I was really afraid to tell people because I was ready for this, <laughs> you know, because I'd mm -hmm. seen, I mean, I grew Absolutely. up hearing this, these messages about people and my ward family would talk about things like this and, and that kind of messaging, you know, it does help to circle the wagons for those who are faithful in a way like there, I can see some of the, some of the, you know, it depends on your audience, right? Your audience is a faithful group of people telling about teaching about Satan, about his attacks um, about apostasy, even talking about apostasy and what that means. That's a different audience than the audience that we're trying to minister to. Um, so we have to adjust our, our messaging based on the different audiences that we're dealing with. Um, and so, yeah, it's just super important. I just can't emphasize it. this. This slide right here, if every member of the church can see this, uh, that has someone that's doubting, we just love that. So please spread the word and, and, and uh, help people to get get uh, educated on how to communicate more effectively. Right. So, okay. So we can talk now about another aspect of this, and we're going to call this uh, section charitable exchange. And so it kind of carries on from the previous slide. And it, you'd think on the left-hand side, it's lacking in charity of empathy of really understanding where the person's at. And the right-hand side, the inclusive side is more charitable. You're really trying to adapt your messaging so that your love cannot only be, be um, communicated to the person, but also received. And that we talk about the feedback loop of, of love all the time in Uplift. And what we mean by that is, is your love actually being received? Is, are you speaking in ways and acting in ways that you think are loving, but the other person doesn't, it's like hitting a brick wall? Well, then that means some adjustment on your part needs to take place. So we're gonna talk about the exchange, which is like a feedback loop, like, you send some charity over, you know, are they able to reciprocate? Um, are they able to even receive the charity that you're sending over? 
And this is a nice little image of a couple here. You know, they're, they're both, you know, to hug someone, you have to both hug. I mean, if you're, have you ever tried hugging somebody, Amanda, who won't hug you back? It's kind of weird, right? <laughs> I'm usually the person who doesn't hug back because I'm oh, not super. <laughs> <laughs> I know it does create an awkward exchange for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of that, you're the person who, who we try to hug and they don't want to be hugged, you know, that's <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I'm a hug, I'm kind of a huggy person, and so, you know, and people probably don't like that. <laughs> if someone doesn't hug me back, I I do feel awkward about that. So this is all about both people hugging, not just one person. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll talk about what we mean here. Uh, and so, do you want to read this for us? Yes. Um. <clears throat> Due to varying levels of belief, mixed faith relationships can experience an abnormal amount of negativity. If left untreated, this negativity can damage us and lead to spiritual, mental, emotional, and even physical separation. Untreated negativity can manifest itself through painful emotions such as confusion, distrust, worry, bitterness, hopelessness, sadness, apathy, disappointment, frustration, anger, loneliness, anxiety, sense of loss, and depression. Okay. So a lot there. Uh, we talked about negativity in previous slide. Uh, and, you, you know, when, when you have a relationship that's strained because of mixed faith, if different levels of belief, <clears throat> there can be a, that gap creates negativity uh, just naturally because expectations are different. Are you going to go to church today? No. Are we going to be able to say a prayer tonight? Yes or no. Um, can we even bless the food anymore? Yes or no? You know, there's all kind. We don't we don't read the scripture anymore. That creates a divide. You know, I, there's all, I just the, the list is endless. And and our hearts want to first want to say our hearts go out to people in these cir circumstances. Um, I I have uh, I have experienced this personally. Not only is the person in doubt, but also with family members, friends who are doubting. And I know that Amanda, you have too, um, and that have experienced this kind of negativity mm -hmm. that, that can in, that can increase if it's not treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, this this list of you know really a be separation eventually physical separation, it seems to be the kind of the place to eventually go, unless both uh, people in the relationship end up leaving faith behind. That usually brings stops the process. But we're, we're hoping for other ways to prevent physical separation, especially. That's the worst one, uh, like, a spe you know, couples that separate and divorce, that sort of thing. Because of a faith difference, it's just, it's just tragic. So, um, <clears throat> okay, any thoughts there before we move on? Um, no, no. Okay, okay. Well, uh, this, this one's going to be... Uh, a little more detailed than what we can what we can do. So we've got a little bit of a suggestion here, uh, uh, something that some of us have tried uh, in, a, in our group, and we feel like it's a great way to to proceed. So this asks, how can we strengthen our relationships despite differences in belief? So not only we're talking about neutrality, where you know the anger stops, the division stops, the awkwardness stops. Um, we, not only that, but we can actually strengthen our relationships. That's what our goal is. Is even if someone is very different in their belief system because of a faith crisis or whatever, uh, how can we still manage to strengthen our relationships? So that's what, that's what it ultimately is all about. Yeah. That's what heaven is, is relationships. So if we can't have relationships with those who are different from us and their beliefs, then that's just not a good place to be. <laughs> so we've got to strengthen these relationships. How can we do it? So here's one suggestion that we've come up with. It's a wonderful place to start if you don't even know where to start. So do you want to read these five bullet points for us, Amanda? Sure. Uh, through frequent charitable exchange, set aside time to meet and talk, look at one another in the eyes, each write down most cherished beliefs, review list of cherished beliefs together, and commit to honoring those beliefs. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Uh, what do you think about this approach? This one, from, from the perspective of the believing spouse or the believing member or the active member um it this is one that that if the if we aren't kind of committed to um this idea it ends up hurting them a lot 
Um, we we want to give the person struggling the benefit of the doubt and understanding that they're just they're really struggling and they might say things that that hurt us, but at the same time. Um, getting the person who is doubting and the person who, who is, who is faithful or who is active to be able to, to um, commit to not pulling down the other, um, I think is just really important uh, to keep positivity and love and peace within that relationship. Mm -hmm. This is a really formal suggestion, right? You sit down with a piece of paper and, and but that, you know, we don't need to laugh that away. I mean, if, if that, that may be what it takes is to say, yeah, hey, absolutely. you know, we're, we're not on the same page. I want to be on the same page with you. I want to love you. I want you to love me in our relationship. Let's, let's sit down and, and set aside some time and look at each other in the eyes, get, put our phones away, you know, whatever we need to do mm -hmm. to make sure that we're actually connecting, you know, spirit to spirit and say, right. what, do you, what do you value? What are your most important morals and values? What do you want in your life? What do you cherish? And I want to respect those, those cherished things. If, you're, if, you want to, if you cherish you know, um, doing service, uh, and that's what you're, where you've kind of turned to is your, your place. I would never you know, tear down your, your desire to serve, even if it's you know, during my, our family uh, prayer time. If you're out you know, serving at night, and you don't believe in the church anymore, but you want to go out and serve, I'm not going to tear you down for wanting to serve. We're going to work around that, and I want to, cher I want to cherish what you cherish. So as an active mm -hmm. member of the church, we can find ways to cherish uh, what those uh, beliefs and those feelings and, and attitudes that the other person now, now cherishes. Uh, do our very best to commit to that. Uh, and so that's a great way to be, have a charitable exchange in a relationship. Um, so that's, uh, that's our suggestion there. Uh, and if other people have, if you're listening to this and you have other ideas of ways that things that you've done in your relationships to, to build those despite a difference in belief, then please let us know. But this is one important way to avoid deconstruction, which, which we've talked about in previous presentations. No more deconstruction of sacred or cherished or honored beliefs, but to meet people where they're at and try to honor the things that they hold to be most sacred or most cherished. So, okay, another topic related to this. This is uh, our good friend Pema Chodron, and she is a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, an ordained nun as well, a wonderful thinker uh, in spirituality and uh, mindfulness. And we're just uh, excited to talk about what she, a short statement that she's given us uh, regarding the weaponization of belief. So this kind of all ties into what we've talked about previously, but divisive messaging, uncharitable messaging. Uh, we can, as members of the church uh, who are believers, we can use our beliefs as a, a sort of hammer, like a, like a sword. <laughs> and people sometimes even refer to, you know, scriptures that talk about uh, swords of, of truth and, and, you know, that, uh, that Jesus flipped tables and things. And we, we, we've got to find a way to, to not pretend as though we, have the authority and the right to damage people uh, by through, you know through our beliefs. Uh, to pre there's there's also a phrase. Have you heard this phrase, Amanda? People say, "I don't need to uh, hold back the truth to protect feelings." Right. So, some variation of that, and that's mm -hmm. a false dichotomy that we're calling out here uh, in, in in different words. But we're going to call that as a false dichotomy. It's false teaching. Because you can do both. You can actually share the truth and share it with charity and protecting the feelings of the receiver. I know it's possible. I, I bear my testimony that, that it's possible. Um, and that the other statement that people like to share, that I'm going to just share the truth and, and come what may, the person ends up doing X, Y, or Z, damaging this, doing that, hurting themselves in some way because of the truth. So be it. You know, it's not or my we problem. Have we have expressions, um, one that, that pops up a lot um, that is really incredibly unhelpful is the sifting of the wheat and the tares. Ah, um, yes. We hear that, you know, as a response to, to people yep. doubting or people struggling with, 
with social issues or whatever, um, we'll go straight to um, prophetic statements of the scriptures that talk about sifting and say, well, there, it's just, it's just a sifting. We knew that a sifting would be coming. Yeah. Um, and that it is, it is never helpful to imply that somebody is a tear. <laughs> I mean, I'm just laughing because uh, it's just so uncomfortable to see these exchanges now. I mean, I, for a time I kind of was there and I felt like I'm justified in laying down the law. You know, I, I was there. And so I, I'm laughing kind of because it's kind of my past. I've done this and I've moved past this pastoral approach is just so much better. Um, and we are not, we are not the sifter. Who's the sifter? Everybody. We, we know who that is. Who's the judge? Not, not you, not me. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a grand judge uh, and a, a final judgment that will take place. And that, and that will not be you or me judging. So passing judgment on people instead of just judging righteously for our own benefit, for the benefit of our family, maybe. Uh, and being meek in our in our judgment and, and cautious in our judgment, all those things are okay. But that's different than passing judgment and weaponizing your beliefs to damage people and not damage and causing pain. It does happen, and we've got to we've really got to stop that. I'm just going to say it. We got to stop this as members of the church. <laughs> we've got to set the example. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've kind of hammered that one. I'm hammering what I'm not supposed to hammer. So here's, this, here's her, her actual quote. We're going to talk about fundamentalism here. Uh, do you want to read this one for us too? Yes. Sometimes people's spiritual ideas become fixed and they use them against those who don't share their beliefs, in effect becoming fundamentalist. It's very dangerous. The finger of righteous indignation pointing at someone who is identified as bad or wrong. Yeah. Amen, Sister Shodron. Amen. I don't have much to add there. It's just, we've got fundamentalism in the church. That's, that's basically what it is. And we always talk about, oh, they're FLDS or whatever, you know? Okay, well, we have people in the church who are fundamentalists who are damaging people because of this weaponization that they're, they're enacting. So, uh, you know, I'm not one of, a, I don't have any authority to call people to repentance. I'm not saying that I, you know, I'm calling, you know, I'm not trying to, be a fundamentalist in, in condemning fundamentalism, but I'm just going to let her words sit here and, and, and read these if you need to, if you feel like you have caused people pain. If they've told you that, if you have someone that, that you love or even a stranger on the internet or whatever that says, you know, you're, you're causing me pain, then you need to think twice about what you're doing. And again, think about that feedback loop. Is your truth and your, the way you're sharing it, is that way you think you're loving the person? You think that you're going to warn them, be the voice of warning? Um, and is it actually being effective if it's working for you and people are actually saying, oh, you know what, you're right. And I feel bad about my path I've been taking. I'm going to repent and turn back to Christ. And if they've said that to you and you have a pattern of doing that, you're probably doing something right. And you're actually preaching in a way that it's re being received effectively. But if it's not, if you're causing division and people are even becoming more entrenched in their a lack of faith, then, then think twice about that. Is it working for you? And that's uh, my message there. It's my call to repentance, even though I have no authority to do that. I'm just, uh, I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have in the church, really. So, I don't know. Okay, I just keep, I keep talking, and Amanda, you're <laughs> allowing me to do so. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move on. <clears throat> uh, this is a, another uh, t related topic here from the great St. Francis of Assisi. And probably people remember this character from school or whatever, the guy with the birds, you know, I thought this, this, this quote was cool, we found, uh, and a, a great uh, Catholic. So we're gonna read this here and I'll read this. Where there is charity and wisdom, there is neither fear nor ignorance. Uh, and so we talked a little bit about fear and being ignorant before, but let's emphasize that here. How do you think, Amanda, how does fear and ignorance get in the way of ministry, do you think? <clears throat> Effective ministry. Um, I, I don't want to kind of downplay when people experience fear of, of others. Um, uh, 
others who are going through faith faith crisis because the fear sometimes is justified. You know, we, we've been taught that, that we need to not procrastinate our repentance, that we need to um, partake of ordinances and do these certain things in order to find happiness in this life and in the next. And so that fear, mm-hmm. I think, um, starts out from a, a good place. Um, but but uh, it, it's... Um, when that sort of grows into like fear of contagion or fear of others, that's, that's when it, it is really, um, a problem. And, and in terms of ignorance and fear, um, they both grow out of the thing that we've already talked about, which is kind of listening first. All of the, the divisive messages that we talked about were very like, prescriptive like this is what you need to do i know you're not doing this you should be doing this um whereas the inclusive messages have more to do with listening and when we listen that's when we kind of uh eliminate or or reduce that ignorance Mm -hmm. yeah what are some of the things that that like as a bleeding member like just practical boots on the ground, right? What would you suggest to somebody who has a family member who has left the church or is starting to leave the church? What are some of the things that you could do to combat that ignorance, um, which would reduce your fear? What, what would you learn about? Um, well, the first thing that I would, I would do is to remind myself that there are other aspects of that relationship. You know, when we have our relationships with people, there are all these sort of strands braided within our relationship. And, you know, a big thick one is usually the church. You know, when we have church uh, spouse or family members who are members of the church. Um, and and it is, it's hard because it's so entwined with the other things. It's hard to separate a bit. Um, it, it's important first to look at and focus on those other things, those other reasons. Um, but um, in terms of, of of learning what they're going through. Um, I would say talk to them to the extent that they're comfortable talking, but don't, don't make it, you know, the primary, you know, crux of, of your relationship. Um, I would say that um, there are great resources that have been written about great books um, that have been written about um, some of these issues that are, are typically problematic for members. Um, and uh, so to, to look those out, you know, um, Patrick Mason's Planted uh, is a big one, The Crucible of Doubt by Terrell Givens. So just seeking out resources that can help you understand both where the person is coming from and from a faithful perspective, understand those issues. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's a great summary. Uh, perfect. So we can move. Now to another illustration uh, from St. Francis. So this is a cool little story. You may want to uh, check it out when you have a chance, but we've got a, we've got a summary here of, of this experience that St. Francis had when he was visiting the Sultan. Uh, and this is an illustration, a portrayal of possibly what had happened there. It's supposedly he, he got his attention by will, being willing to walk over fire. And there's some, I think some myth, uh, mythical elements, and mysticism that that kind of accom- eventually accompanied this story. But as far as the experience, we we've it seems like it actually did happen where Saint Francis did uh, try to visit and uh, try to uh, teach the the Sultan. So we're going to see a nice little summary here of that experience. Um, and if you want to read the first slide, and then I can take a turn on the next slide. Francis boldly entered enemy territory, prepared to die, armed only with his zeal to save souls. He was immediately beaten and chained by the Saracens and brought before the Sultan. There he informed the Sultan that he came as a messenger of God to reveal the truth of Christianity and save the Sultan's soul. (laughs) So so we could look at this uh, and say, is this a good example or bad? I mean, I don't know. Like this kind of of, uh, bold approach often seems to be backfiring with us today and as we boldly go into enemy you know us versus them enemy territory prepared to die (laughs) zeal i mean all these are like hot button words here that i'm seeing um you know 
I'm a messenger of God. I'm going to save your soul. I mean, that kind of stuff, just to, you talk about fire, it just ignites the fire in the person who usually today, uh, who's trying to, re, trying to save, trying to rescue, right? <laughs> right. right. So, interesting, right? So something though, interesting, we'll, we'll see what happens next. <clears throat> Despite the Imams, sorry, Imams urging to cut off Francis' head, the Sultan, and I think the Imams are actually these, uh, some of these counselors that he has. The Sultan was moved by Francis's concern for the Sultan's eternal salvation. So he was moved by Francis' concern for the Sultan's eternal salvation. So somehow he communicated that effectively. One of Francis's companions described the Sultan, that cruel beast who in response to Francis became sweetness itself. Huh, interesting. By God's grace, Francis was allowed to stay for weeks in the court of the Sultan discussing theology and evangelizing him. And apparently, I think deathbed repentance, I think, Finch, I think he initially declined, ultimately after the two weeks, declined the message, but apparently at his deathbed, the Sultan actually accepted Jesus and, and was saved, but I don't know if that's mystical or not. Uh, but anyway, so interesting, right, is that you, the first slide really points to, wow, this boldly, he's a bold zealot. He's going in because he's going to save someone's soul. But somehow in the course of his, his communication, I'm, I'm seeing meekness behind this. A meekness and a very sincere concern of, of real love for the sultan, right? That somehow he was able to soften that heart or God was able to through uh, Francis's words. So something happened and he became sweetness itself. I'm thinking a charitable exchange to hap happen of some, some type, right? We don't know the details of exactly what was said probably, but any thoughts there? How, would, how, did you, how did you turn that around from being such a fiery <laughs> initial, you know, it's going to be a, a, a bomb is going to go off in the, in the court. How did you turn that around, do you think? Amanda, any thoughts? Well, I think that, that communicating, um, you know, when we, when, we read the, when we read the scriptures or we read these kind of uh, ancient stories or, or stories of different times of, of the sort of bold declarations, um, they, kind of, they give us one picture within a culture that's fairly different um, from ours. Um, and so, of course, you know, we, we can see from this story that we can learn from this story that, you know, we, we do not have to be shy in what we, or embarrassed about what we believe in and that the things that we believe in um, have the opportunity to turn people's hearts, but we have to communicate in the way, you know, within our culture and within our relationship, kind of the, the way, like you said, that exhibits meekness, um, that exhibits uh, understanding, love, compassion, um, and so that that's why kind of when you when you are having an exchange with with someone who's struggling, really um, it's important to make it a matter of prayer and of really thinking about this person as an individual and how can I best communicate with them rather than just um, you know having an excess focus on boldness. Yeah. Yeah. The come what may, let the cards fall where they may, you know, I, you know, take it or leave it. I'm, I'm going to give you this chance. I'm going to wipe, you know, wipe my feet, the dust off my feet, you know, those kind of, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, loving this person and overt love, just making sure it's very clear. And yeah, I mean, and the culture is different, right? This probably was something that was maybe expected that Sultan maybe had visitors like this and, uh, is a di very different situation, but there's some principles here that we can try to try to take away, um, and and never to be like you said, never to be embarrassed or afraid. We shouldn't be afraid to. We don't need to remain in silence uh, as believers uh, and never say anything. I think that's that's the the opposite direction of where I, I personally believe. I'm not. I don't talk about Satan often. I have mentioned him a few times in our presentation. I don't think it's super effective to talk about him, but. I think Satan really, he wants us to remain silent and to never say anything um, mm -hmm. with, with love. He wants us to just sit and, and just, and, and only connect in ways outside of, of Christ and outside of the church uh, and only do that and just, and just accept and fully embrace um, 
everything about that person without ever saying anything. So that, that's the that's the downfall here, and that's the extra step that we're we're suggesting in uplift is that we should not ever leave this part out. The evangelizing part needs to be done. It's some somehow that's that's our responsibility as believers, and we never need to take the message so in such opposite direction where I'm afraid I can never say anything because I don't want to offend the person or further drive them away. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit as believers and know how to communicate with great love and doing it in a way or private in settings that are comfortable, that are, are very um, gentle. And there's always going to be room, should always be room for in, gently encouraging someone to return to faith, never to, to completely remain in silence forever. If someone says, you know what, don't ever talk to me about this again, ever again, uh, ever, ever, ever again, that kind of language, then maybe give them some time and, and then maybe uh, gently ask again sometime down the road when you feel, feel like maybe they have maybe changed their, their view. But anyway, that's the message of uplift is to not give up. Right. Um, <clears throat> another nice little slide here that emphasizes this. This is one of our favorite scriptures in uplift. Uh, and if you want to read this for us too, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, I just, when I see this, these words um, and see the nice little heart in the pool, it's kind of a cool little image. I think about my own mother and the way that she talks about uh, people who she loves who have left faith behind. And the way she talks to these people and about these people is just pure love. I mean, she is the example there. And and do you know people like this, Amanda, in your life um, that speak this way, that they speak with the tongue of, of men and of angels, but also have charity? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, it is definitely... Uh, a spiritual gift that some are blessed with that we all can work towards of, of trying to feel um, uh, the Savior's love and our Heavenly Parents' love for our brothers and sisters. Um, and I, I think that when we can experience that, um, this is not my personal spiritual gift that comes very easily, but it's something that I I try to work for um, it does uh, it's um, it is very powerful absolutely mm -hmm. yeah we don't want to sound like brass or tinkling cymbals in the church and that goes down kind of goes back to what we talked about before the feedback loop loop of love if you're speaking with what well, you perceive to be charity but the person on the receiving end does not perceive it that way can't can't even see it anywhere anywhere close to being loving and let's try to adjust and try something else try something that they may actually receive as and perceive as being loving uh and and then with that open door of love um i think we can speak boldly and with the tongue of men and of angels and be able to um, share the gospel and help people to return to faith uh, and that's what happened to me i mean i i'm just so grateful for the the good people who surrounded around, you know, surrounded me in my time of faith crisis and, and spoke in this way. I felt their love and I felt uh, like they had genuine, they really genuinely concerned, were concerned and genuinely loved me. And I felt that. So very, very important. Okay. Uh, this next section, we're going to talk about something a little less pleasant, but it's important. Uh, and we're kind of winding up our presentation here, but this section is about betrayal. And this is a word that's at the heart of faith crisis. And a lot of people feel betrayal um, in different ways throughout their lives. But within the context of uplift and feeling like your faith is in crisis, your identity is in crisis, um, a lot of people do feel betrayed uh, by all kinds of things. The church leaders, for example, a local leader or general leaders. You can feel betrayed by a family member or by your institute teachers or seminary teachers or by the scriptures themselves, um, by God even. And you can feel this betrayal and experience this um, throughout your life. Uh, so we're gonna read a little poem. This poem is about someone who experiences three different guiding lights in their life. 
And the first light that we'll read about on the first page, this first uh, slide, uh, the first light represents deception and a source of deception uh, and being betrayed by that source. The second light represents faithful knowledge. And the third light represents Jesus Christ. So we'll read this poem together and see how these lights um, in this poem helps to illustrate what we mean by betrayal. Uh, do you want to read this first page for us? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a light. I follow, I find, I feed, consuming more, listening less, darkest fire devouring, painful burning, cornered, cowering, and bound, but not knowing, hunted, haunted, and alone, frantic mind, searching eyes. Okay, so this first light represents deception. And um, as someone, for, for me, as someone who has experienced faith crisis, this really describes my entry into the world of cynical material, uh, the attacking ch our church, our leaders, our doctrine, our policies. This really describes that, that experience that I had and attacking specifically for me, uh, Joseph Smith. So I followed uh, and I fed on this material, this information. I started listening less. Uh, this is just describes my experience to a T here. So very, very helpful. Um, and I actually imagine this light kind of being my computer screen. Actually, that's where I spent my time alone studying it was on my computer, uh, the light from my computer. So, so I, I, I appreciate this, this first portion of this poem. Uh, <clears throat> next one, this light represents faithful knowledge. Again, a light untrusting I oblige, mouth moving heart of steel, deep love and reason sprouting hope, a sacred seed replanted, nourished reaching, with tender faith, unshackled, sensing his yoke, I stand. So this one also kind of describes my experience. And I don't know if it, it, it talks to you as well, Amanda, or not. But I kind of felt like I found a light uh, of someone who reached out and with love. I was untrusting in initially, but I obliged. And then with mouths moving, I, my heart was still of steel. But I felt that deep love and reason and it sprouted hope within me. So I don't know, does this resonate with you at all? Did this happen with you as you went through your faith crisis? So, somehow you found a light? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was blessed in, you know, al almost basically everybody that I opened up to was, was very um, supportive and, and gave me enough of, um, enough of a, a light to kind of keep hanging on. Um, and then, you know, as, as you keep hanging on and you feel love, it kind of gives you, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's like, it's Alma 32, right? You, you, then you're encouraged to kind of exercise a little bit of faith and you feel like, oh, okay, this tastes good. You know, this feels good. I can, this is something that I can keep keep uh growing but it, it starts out with just that little bit of glimmer of it's okay you're loved it's okay mm -hmm. yeah that's great uh okay and then this the final slide here the the poem um and i think i, I can read this one a light walking relaxing in my quiet moments i listen the one betrayed, bleeding my blame. Warm sunlight descends, piercing, melting, soothing. This is life eternal, his abundant grace. I kneel, I worship, I weep. So that third light represents Jesus Christ uh, and walking with him. And I love this line here, bleeding my blame. I blamed and he bled, bled that for me. And my blame has been swallowed up in his atonement. My heart uh, has no more animosity. So I love this poem because it paints my, my story of betrayal. Initially, I felt betrayed by Joseph Smith. I felt betrayed by my leaders, my parents even. I felt betrayed by the temple. I felt betrayed by primary songs. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I mean, the betrayal was just so deep. The pain was so deep. And, and then through the light, um, I feel like that betrayal, I was actually betrayed instead of by who I thought I was betrayed by. I, you know, of course, the church, I think, can do a better job, and we are doing a better job at being more proactive in our education and being open about, you know, being vulnerable and admitting when we're making mistakes, that sort of thing. We're getting better at that. But I felt like I was betrayed by just my personal experience. I was betrayed by uh, critics of the church, detractors, whatever you want to call um, people that are engaging in deconstructive messaging. Uh, I don't want to label people, of course, but I felt betrayed by these people because they'd created videos and articles and things that I felt like that they were, that was the truth. I felt like it was, that was the source of truth that I'd always been missing. I, I took it hook, line, and sinker. I loved it. I, I embraced it fully. I trusted it. Um, and I felt like I'd finally been, my eyes had been opened. I felt like, but that betrayal that I felt that they were telling me I was betrayed by the church I ended up being, I feel like I've been betrayed by them actually. And that blame that I, I, I blamed the church initially, my blame shifted to after I was healed, but shifted back to the detractors, people that fed me misinformation. But that blame eventually has now, now has been uh, healed. I don't blame anybody anymore. I'm at peace. So that's my experience. Anything you want to add there? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so great place to be for me. And I just really appreciate this, this poem that was sent to us. Thank you. Uh, okay. This final slide, few slides, and then we're going to be done, uh, is about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we have a couple scriptures and a couple quotes to, to share. Uh, Amanda, can you read this section for us, 1 Nephi 19.9? Yes. And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it. And they smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it. Because of his loving kindness, and his long suffering toward the children of men. That's great. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful example. If we feel like we're being persecuted as, as members of the church, if you felt like you've been betrayed uh, as you've been through a faith crisis, allow your Savior into your life and to heal you um, he suffered all and he experienced all of this for you for us uh, okay and then this is from president nelson and i can read this one <clears throat> because the savior offered himself as the infinite atonement you and i have the opportunity the privilege to be forgiven when we repent. We can also turn to him for healing of our hearts, for strength when we are weak, and for help to do things we simply cannot do on our own. I testify that he is the living Christ, our Lord our and Savior, exemplar, redeemer, and judge. Beautiful testimony from President Nelson. And now we'll watch a short video uh, from Kind of my, he's like kind of my prophet, the prophet that I grew up with. <clears throat> he is my savior and my redeemer. Through giving his life in pain and unspeakable suffering, he has reached down to lift me and each of us and all the sons and daughters of God from the abyss of eternal darkness following death. He has provided something better, a sphere of light and understanding, growth and beauty where we may go forward on the road that leads to eternal life. My gratitude knows no bounds. My thanks to my Lord has no conclusion. He is my God and my King, from everlasting to everlasting.
He will reign and rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. To, <coughs> to his dominion there will be no end. To his glory there will be no light. None other can take his place. None other ever will. Unblemished and without fault of any kind, he is the Lamb of God to whom I bow. <laughs> and through whom I approach my Father in heaven. Okay. The emotion there is beautiful, and, and that uh, reminds me of before my faith crisis, I had uh, such wonderful experiences with, with uh, President Hinckley. And, uh, and I've had a strong testimony and I just, whenever I listen to him again, I just rem I'm reminded by that beautiful, simple faith that I had, a very pure testimony. Um, and my testimony is different now and deeper, but really appreciated his uh, emotion for the Savior. And, and just imagining, um, you know, again, I love to imagine kneeling at the feet of my Savior and, and worshiping him and thanking him for his sacrifice and his beautiful life and his love for me, selfless sacrifice. And uh, that brings a great peace and love into my and light into my life when I imagine those things. So I invite people that are listening who are doubting to take a moment and to imagine if you need to pause, imagine uh, approaching your savior and thinking and being with him and experiencing his light and his love uh, and, and be open to the feelings of the Holy Spirit as you imagine that experience. Um, and uh, I believe that you'll feel a greater light and love and, your, and peace in your heart and in your mind. Uh, now the final uh, quote from President Okazaki. Do you wanna read this for us, Amanda? Are you there? Yes, I would love to read it. <clears throat> Strengthen yourselves by seeking the source of true strength, the Savior. Come unto him. He loves you. He desires your happiness and exults in your desires for righteousness. Make him your strength, your daily companion, your rod and your staff. Let him comfort you. There is no burden we need bear alone. His grace compensates for our deficiencies. Through the years, my circumstances have changed. I was a single woman, then the wife of a non-member, then a partner in a temple ceiling a mother, a mother-in-law, and a grandmother, and now a widow. I have known the Savior's love in all of these circumstances. My own faith has been rewarded as I have felt the Savior's presence and power in my home. From the bottom of my heart and from more than 50 years of experience in the church, I testify that the Savior extends to all of us that same mercy, the same healing power, and the same perfect love. I say this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Such a beautiful uh, testimony from her. Um, I'd like to share, before we close, I'd like to share my uh, feelings for my Savior. And uh, I've done that throughout in, in small ways. But um, I've, as I thought about this experience on the earth and how blinded I feel uh, the veil is so thick and um, how weak I am. Uh, uh, the Book of Mormon talks about my nothingness and my unprofitable nature. And I just, I marvel at the thought of this uh, graceful, compassionate, selfless being full of light and truth. Um, and when I imagine my savior and, I, I can't see him, obviously. He's not here with me. But as I look at pictures and watch videos of him and listen to his words and read his words, I can feel um, a growing light within me. Uh, and it, it brings me such great joy. And this goes back to epistemology and the beauty of, of Christ, the idea of Christ, of this uh, saving power, this lifting power that he, he has, that he's had from the beginning. Uh, this grace that he so freely gives. 
uh, that beautiful idea just resonates deep within me. And I, I, I feel bad. I, I repented for the time, even though we don't talk about doubt being a sin. I repent. Um, I repented for my time of unbelief. I felt like I needed to. Um, I, I didn't feel like people were telling me to do that, gratefully. But at a certain point, I felt like I needed to pray and ask for forgiveness for, for leaving God behind as I turned to atheism. And I've since uh, felt that repentance process uh, heal me and to come back into full fellowship with Christ. And as I partake of the sacrament each week, uh, when I can go, when, when we're not sick, our little kids are sometimes sick and I have to stay home. But when I, as, as I go um, and I partake of the sacrament and I, and I feel of his um, cleansing power, the atonement, uh, sanctifying power, as I partake of those emblems, sacred emblems, I can feel that uh, lifting and redeeming power in my unprofitable nature, my nothingness, turn to something, turn to something greater. My, my desires change. I look at my, my wife and my children with, with great eyes of love and my heart opens and I I speak words of kindness, um, and I notice in the hallways at church, after church, people are friendlier, shaking hands. Um, the Spirit works miracles uh, on me personally and other people. It, it enhances my personality to make me feel more loving, more charitable. And these beautiful signs uh, of he from heaven, uh, from my Savior, that he's real, is all I need right now to go on. I'd like to have more evidence. I'd love to see him one day. And I occasionally pray for that experience. But at this point in my life, I, I don't need that. And I, I felt such great beauty uh, in belief, in returning to belief, uh, that I'm, I'm happy. I'm at peace. Uh, we had a tornado come through <laughs> our area this week. And although I was very scared, uh, felt very scared, um, because it was headed right for our home. It was like two miles away, and then it lifted. Uh, the last moment uh, went around and, and and we didn't get hit. Uh, I was I, I was sitting in the bathroom huddling with my children with the mattress over our heads, and we were singing songs and 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 praying together. I felt um, a sense of peace at the same time of being scared, but I didn't feel like panic. I felt like uh, we we're going to be together. It's going to be okay. So my testimony is that Christ can be with us if we don't have him to seek him out and to, to allow him to heal you and to allow your faith to increase, allow your doubt to dissipate and, and uh, over time that you can feel like you belong uh, back in the church uh, where everyone has their challenges and Christ is merciful unto all. And to not single yourself out as being the odd one out, to know that all of us struggle, all of us are sinners, all of us are weak and need him. I need him, and uh, and I share my my love for my Savior and testimony of him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Anything you'd like to add, Amanda, before we finish up here? Um. Yeah. Uh, I would. I would just say, um, uh, as someone who. Um, experienced a, uh, a faith crisis um, you know I, I came out of it um, not knowing as many things as I thought I knew before um, and that's something that you hear a lot from people who have gone through faith crisis crises but um, one thing that that I do know and that I hope that um, everyone who's experiencing doubts and faith crisis can can come to find is that our heavenly parents are very intimately aware of us i can testify to that and i have i mean just yesterday uh, i had a ha, had a powerful reminder that that they are so aware of us that they are there and um, sometimes it takes some, some seeking and some intentional uh, awareness to be able to feel that, but, but they are there, um, and they, they do love us, and, and I do also have a testimony of um, how much 
I so just need our Savior. I just, I just need Jesus every day, you know, um, and how much better and how much more light I, I feel in my life um, with, with Jesus. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and I guess I would just say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're done. This has been quite the project and uh, just grateful for everyone to be with us. Um, and we look forward to interacting with you, to sharing our light with you and our love with you. Uh, and we're all here for you. Don't feel alone. Uh, keep working, keep uh, trying. And uh, it's our testimony that you'll, you'll find your way. And uh, whatever path you take, uh, either stay with Uplift or find another community or another place of peace. We're glad. We're happy for you, uh, no matter where you go. Uh, uh, and But we, we want you to stay with us. We invite you to stay with us, to work on this, um, and to be patient with yourself and with others, with us even. And we just love you again, and, and we, we share our love with you with um, all of our hearts. And we'll We'll see you. We'll see you soon. I guess that's all we can say. That's it's. I'm sad this is over, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long, long time of working on this. Um, so take care, everybody, and we'll see you soon.